2011 Ford Edge 3.5 liter V6. Customer complaint is a check engine light goes on and off. We can see now just getting in the car, I've got it running already. The check engine light is currently not on. So I'm gonna go ahead and take a look at fault code, see what we have, and we will go from there. All right, guys, I've got the vehicle identified here. So yeah, 2011 Ford Edge is the front wheel drive version with the 3.5 liter V6. This is not an EcoBoost engine, it's just a plain Jane uh, six cylinder engine. The code we have in memory, P0306, cylinder six misfire. Just sitting here at idle, I did not feel a miss. Giving it some gas, seeing how it reacts. Still don't feel a miss. So I think the next step for me is uh, gonna be to look at some freeze frame data, see how this vehicle was being driven when this occurred. So to get to this uh, freeze frame data, guys, you know, this information I wanna look at, what we're gonna do is we're gonna click on generic functions. And then we're gonna click on this mode two at the top right corner, that's our freeze frame data. What this is going to give us is a basic snapshot of all of the collected data that the engine computer sensed when this event took place and this fault code was set. So things that I'm especially concerned with are things like throttle position and engine speed. We can see here, this top left pit is the engine speed and we can see it was at 5,000 RPM. This vehicle was getting driven pretty hard when this occurred. Um, if we just keep scrolling down through here, Airflow rate, we have 156 pound, or grams per second, excuse me. So this thing was pretty much wound out, guys. Wound out hard. Um, just taking a quick look. We were at operating temperature when this was set. I'm looking for a vehicle speed. Yep, there we go, 45 miles an hour. So it looks like when this event took place, this thing was pretty much pegged wide open throttle. This guy was at about five, 6,000 RPM. Uh, maybe maybe verging onto an on-ramp, something like that. So, uh, yeah, we're going to chase after this. Uh, next thing I want to look at is I want to look at some cylinder contribution numbers while we have the vehicle stationary here idling. So that's what's next. So back to the main menu here in the uh, OEM mode of the Varus. To get to this cylinder contribution test, what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on functional tests, and then I'm going to click on cylinder contribution tests. Then I'm going to walk you guys through what forward cylinder contribution test does and how it kind of how it can help us identify misfiring cylinders. So if we see these top six numbers here, we see cylinder one, two, three, four, five, six value data. So the way this works is negative numbers indicate poor contribution from that cylinder. Positive numbers indicate good contribution from that cylinder. As you can see, sitting here at idle, all the numbers are floating around zero. That is normal. What we're really looking for is for one of these cylinders to go way negative, you know, negative 10, negative 20. That would indicate a misfiring cylinder. This is the way Ford does this. And uh, not, not too bad of a design. There's some definite variables to using this. So what I'm gonna do is, the car is still idling. I'm just gonna kind of snap a throttle a few times and you know, eyeball these numbers and see if I can pick out a specific cylinder that's uh, contributing less than the rest. Snapping the throttle on and off now. We see a little blip on cylinder three there. Remember our number, our trouble code memory was a PO306. So this isn't really helping us too much here, guys. Everything looks fairly normal. I saw a negative count at one point on cylinder number three. Again, our misfire trouble code was cylinder number six. Now, there's some issues with that. The engine computer misfire monitor is not that accurate. It will very often times, especially on Ford, misidentify cylinders. Just because we have a PO306 in memory does not mean that cylinder six is our problem. So I think our next step here to try and get this misfire to happen and give us some sort of direction is gonna be the test drive of the car. That coming up next. All right guys, so I'm out test driving this vehicle and I'm just trying to find a nice secluded little road to do this safely. Um, this is a road out behind the shop. This is usually where I typically do stuff like this. Uh, what I want to do with this car is I just want to do a wide open throttle run and I want to evaluate how the engine's running. 
see if I can duplicate this misfire. So I'm just waiting for this traffic to come by. All right, I'm going to bring the vehicle to a stop. Hopefully you guys can see the gauges there pretty well. I'm just going to peg it to the floor, guys. I'm going to do a first gear wind out out to about 40 miles an hour, and we'll see what we see what we uh, see what happens. So here we go. Definitely feel some hesitation there. I don't know if you guys noticed the hesitation. It started off pretty good, and then uh, we lost a lot of power midway through that run. I'm going to do that one more time. On the throttle. A little bit of hesitation, not a whole lot that time. I'm going to bring this thing back to a stop. We're going to do it one more time. So far, I'm definitely feeling a feeling a mid-range hesitation. And now the car is misfiring. I feel it. Definite misfire there. You guys you can kind of see the camera bouncing up and down. Yeah, dead misfire, dead misfire. We have a flashing check engine light. Some bad hesitation. So, all right, this is the complaint. We were able to duplicate it. Um, my next step is going to be to take a look at cylinder contribution numbers during this and see see what cylinder the engine computer is interpreting is causing this condition. So I'm going to get you guys focused on that next. All right, so I've got the vehicle stopped again, guys. I'm going to do another one of these runs. I've got you guys focused on the scan tool. I'm just giving it some throttle. Let's watch these numbers. Bad hesitation, bad hesitation there. To me, it kind of felt like the engine was starving for fuel almost. I currently have a flashing check engine light. As you guys can see. So I'm going to get this vehicle parked and we're going to uh, kind of take a look at what we got here and determine what direction we want to, uh, we want to pursue. Alright guys, so I've got some data pulled up from that run we did. Um, the only real thing I'm noticing here is if we look at cylinder number 6, we can see that at this portion of our run here, we had you know very, very low numbers. You know, we went down to negative 64 as far as contribution goes. We also see that at the same time over here on cylinder number 3. Um, one thing to note about these Fords is cylinder number 6 and cylinder 3 are on two opposite banks. The front bank, this being a V6, is cylinder 1, 2, and 3, or excuse me, the front bank is cylinder 4, 5, and 6, and the rear bank on this engine is cylinder 1, 2, and 3. So two different banks here, so uh, that maybe potentially points us away from a bank-specific concern. Um, when I was driving this, it definitely felt like a fuel issue to me. Um, it felt like we were starving for fuel. So the next thing I want to look at while test driving this car is some mass airflow numbers as well as oxygen sensors. Um, that's going to give us some confirmation as to whether we are running lean or not during this event. So that's coming up next. Alright guys, so what I've done here is I switched over to the uh, global menu because I couldn't, I couldn't get all the PIDs that I wanted on the same screen going through the OE menu. So what I'm looking for, or I'm looking for any fuel-related PIDs here that are going to help me to identify if this is a lean-type misfire or not. Um, some PIDs I'm going to pull up for this test are going to be engine speed. Let me see. I'm going to pull up throttle position. Definitely worried about airflow rate, guys. This is based off of the mass airflow. And then I want our downstream oxygen sensors. The reason I'm doing the downstream is just to make it a little bit easier. This uh, vehicle uses air fuel sensors. And I'm just trying to do this quickly. I don't want to identify or I'm trying to avoid uh, determining, you know, kind of what style of sensor this is. So I'm just going to use these downstream sensors as my guide to whether this thing is actually running lean or not. And then I'm also going to pull up our calculated and absolute load values. So the ones I'm really, really concerned about here is I'm concerned about my O2s. So I'm going to graph those while we do this test. So, yeah. I'm going to get us pulled back out onto the test track, as it were. And we're going to redo this wide open throttle test. Just trying to get this, uh, just trying to do this safely here, guys. We want to be safe when we're doing tests like this. We don't want to be around a whole lot of traffic or anything. 
So I'm gonna wait till this vehicle uh, gets out of our way. And then I'm gonna peg the throttle. We're collecting data right now. Um, once we get done with this run, I'm gonna find a safe place to park and then we're gonna review the data, analyze it, and see what sort of condition we have here. So here we go in three, two, one. Definitely some periodic hesitation through that, guys. No doubt about it. So uh, we're going to take a park, look at this data, see how it looks, and we'll go from there. All right, guys. This is a pretty decent picture as far as uh, as far as what happened with this test run we just did. At this 110, a little bit after mark is where we actually initiated the test. We can see that as indicated by our throttle position. What we want to see on a good system that's not running lean or anything crazy like that is we want to see our O2 sensors, our oxygen sensors. We want to see them peg rich and we want to see them stay rich throughout the entire event. What we can see here, if we look at this frame 110 here, our oxygen sensors, they initially dip lean. And you can see that reflected in both. And then they come back up rich. Now there's some issues with this and you know I can't really trust this test at this point and the reason for that is this vehicle has traction control and I believe that this traction control is operated using fuel cut and when we pegged the throttle on this we kind of saw that happen and I think that may be skewing these readings but that's okay we can still analyze some of the other data we captured here. Um, I also want to look at this airflow, airflow rate number and just kind of see what our max number was. And it looks like we went up to about 208 grams per second on that. That's really kind of outstanding, guys. We're also going to look at this calculated load value. And we can see all throughout that event, starting shortly after frame 110, we hit a maximum calculated load of 100. So based off of that, I'm not really suspecting that we have an issue with the air, the uh, air, uh, mass airflow sensor. Um, still potentially a lean condition. What I think I want to do on this vehicle is I want to redo this test one more time and I want to disable the traction control so we can avoid that fuel cut event taking place and skewing our oxygen sensors. So that's what's going to come up next. All right, guys, I'm getting back on our test track here. Um, I couldn't figure out how to disable traction control on this and I'm, I wasn't about to waste a bunch of time trying to do it. So what I'm going to do is start this test and uh, I'm just going to kind of ease into it at first. So here we go. Real bad hesitation. I feel it real bad here. All right, so we're going to take another look at these numbers. The check engine lights currently flashing as we can see. I definitely felt some uh, pretty severe hesitation throughout all of that. So uh, yeah, let's take a look at this data. So we're taking a look at this data, guys. Um, it looks like where we started our run was right here shortly after frame 350. Uh, we can see our engine RPM increasing at that time. Um, looking at both of these sensors, they both initially dropped lean. Um, that could potentially be normal. Uh, we see shortly after that initial lean dip, they both went rich and they stayed rich pretty much throughout the entire duration of the run. So this is kind of pointing away from a fuel issue. We may come back to this as being a fuel issue, but you know, based off of what I'm seeing here, I don't believe a lean condition or fuel starvation or anything like that is causing this misfire. So the next step is going to be to go after ignition next. So I'm just thinking about symptoms, guys. You know, I'm trying to trying to get this car figured out. Um, I haven't left the driver's seat yet, and I'm trying to avoid it because it's pretty cold and miserable outside today. Uh, so I, I'm just trying to get as much information as I can in the driver's seat before I have to go out under the hood and try and determine what the world's going on with this car. So uh, one thing I want to do before we go mess around with that and chasing after ignition and all that stuff is I just want to reread fault codes. Um, before we had a P0306, that was all we had, and now we don't have any codes. That's interesting. Um... It's kind of funny that it cleared the coats out while we were driving it. I wasn't expecting that. Pulling this freeze frame menu up now. Let's see if we have any freeze frame data. And yet we still have freeze frame for this PO306. A little strange there. Whatever. But uh, one thing 
you know, one thing I'm, I'm noticing, guys, is it doesn't feel like a single cylinder issue to me. It feels like the entire car is low on power. Um, you know, typically we would attribute that to one of two things, either a lean condition or a restricted exhaust. So I'm not sure what direction I want to go in, and I'm always thinking about direction. You know, that's always what we need to think about. Um... You know, where do we go first? Do we take a look at some ignition stuff? Or do we take a look at, uh, you know, a possible exhaust restriction? It's pretty tough to say. Hmm. So let's think. What's going to be easiest? You know, I'm, I'm not 100% yet. Maybe we should go out under the hood at this point and take a look, kind of get an idea of where everything is, what's going to be easy to test, what's not going to be, and make our call based off of that. So let's get the hood popped. Let's take a looky. Let's see what we got, and we'll uh, hopefully make a decision as far as direction after that. All right, guys, so I've got the hood popped on this car. Uh, this being a six-cylinder engine, and it's mounted transversely, we only have real access to three cylinders, these front three up here. Uh, these cylinder numbers are four, five, and six. Cylinders one, two, and three are on the back, and there is no way to get to them back there, so we're not going to be testing those directly at all. Um, I'm just trying to think of what's what's easy to get to. We have an oxygen sensor right here available to us to possibly do an exhaust um, exhaust back pressure measurement at. Um, we have real good access to these front three coils as well as these front three fuel injectors. So uh, I think the easiest thing to do at this point, and uh, you know, just to try and get some sort of direction here, is to look at primary ignition. And the way we're going to do that is. We're going to put a T-pin in the control wire, this coil, this being the number six, the one we had the trouble code for. I'm going to run a set of jumper leads inside the vehicle, and then we're going to go test drive it while monitoring primary voltage of this ignition coil and see if we can get direction based off the way this uh, ignition waveform looks. So I'm going to get that hooked up and uh, show you guys that. So this is the setup, guys. I have a T-pin installed in the control wire of this number six ignition coil. I have done a set of long test leads. One lead is connected to the battery negative from my scope going through the hood, in between the door jam, into the engine compartment, or excuse me, the passenger compartment, where I have my meter leads hooked up to it. And if we look at the meter, we can see I have a primary, primary voltage waveform displayed on the screen. This is this number six coil firing in sequence. Some things we can notice looking at this right away, this being a Ford, this is a MSD multiple strike discharge ignition system at low rpms this ignition coil is going to fire more than once as we can see here it's being currently fired two times with the vehicle just sitting here idling so what we're going to do is while we monitor all of this we're going to test drive the vehicle since we can't get it to miss at idle and we're going to take a look at this uh take a look at this ignition waveform and see if it gives us any direction so that's coming up next so one quick thing before we get on this test drive one thing i need to really uh really stress to you guys is you got to be careful when you're doing testing like this and you're running leads in from the engine compartment. You don't want a bunch of leads hanging outside of the car or hanging in the engine compartment to get ate up by a fan. We also don't want these leads touching together, you know, my negative and my positive. If, if that were to happen, this coil would be energized all of the time. It would basically be shorted to ground on the control circuit and it could potentially damage the coil. Um, it's not going to hurt the computer at all, but, you know, we definitely don't want to cause a problem. Um, on top of the problems we already have. So just be careful when you're doing testing from the driver's seat like this. So, uh, yep, next stop, test drive. All right, guys, so I'm test driving the vehicle. I've got it out on the road. I'm just going to keep you guys focused on the waveform that's displaying on the screen. I'm going to give it some gas. I want you guys to tell me if you see anything. I don't know about you guys, but I definitely saw it. We're going to do that one more time, and then I'm going to stop the capture, find a good place to park, and then uh, we'll talk about this waveform a little bit. Um, what I can tell you guys, basically, at this point, this is boiling down to an ignition problem, no doubt about it. I'm getting back on the throttle now. Wham, look at that. So I'm just going to stop this capture. At this point, without a doubt, guys, I have evidence that this is an ignition system problem. Once I get parked, we'll talk a little bit more about the waveform we just got, what exactly we're looking at, how I set the scope up, and some good stuff like that. So, yep, 
just uh, stand by. So I've got this capture on the screen, guys, and uh, we've got our buffer filled up pretty good. What I'm going to do to look at all the information we got is I'm just going to click this magnifying glass and it's going to zoom out on everything. Um, this is all of our collected data here. Kind of hard at this zoom level to pick out what we want to see. But I think what we're looking for are these two, you know, really high uh, voltage firing events here. I think that's where our issue is going to be. Not 100%. Uh, let me tighten up this, zoom in just a little bit more. We have a little bit better of an idea as far as where everything is now. So I'm just going to scroll through this, and I'm going to pick out one of these that doesn't look right to me. And uh, on the screen, I see one. I'm going to drag my little magnifying cursor over here, and I'm going to zoom in on this again. I definitely don't like that one. Let me zoom all the way in. So, I mean, that looks somewhat okay. We see there's a lot of hash in the in the firing line of this, and there, excuse me, in the spark line. Um, I don't think that's the one that I really saw on the test drive that stuck out to me. So I'm just going to zoom back out. Scroll through this buffer a little bit. I want to find the one that really, really stuck out to me real good. I know some of you guys probably aren't, you know, aren't too sure about what you're looking at with these. And that's fine. That's okay. We'll cover it. Get you guys a little bit, uh better of an idea as far as what's going on with these captures so all i'm doing is i'm just scrolling through this and i'm, I'm looking for the bad the bad one while we do that um one thing we can do real quick is we can talk about a good one this is an okay looking firing event guys so if we look at this waveform it's not the best i have peak detect on so there's a little bit of noise in this at this point here when this bar drops low this is battery voltage here this line when this drops low that's when the engine computer is actually grounding the coil and beginning to charge it so all during this period this you know approximately two millisecond period here the engine computer has supplied a ground to the control side of the ignition coil at this point here when we first see this line pop up what's basically happened is the engine computer has let go of that ground basically opened its transistor and what happened is, is all that magnetic field that was built up in this coil's winding collapsed, and that's what this voltage spike is. Um, you know, kind of going over the ins and outs of these waveforms is kind of a class on its own, guys. Uh, really what we're trying to do with this is just figure out what's wrong with this car, figure out what the cause of our misfire is. So I'm going to look through this buffer real quick, and I'm going to find our bad one, and I'll bring you guys back when I do. All right, guys, so I've got a waveform pulled up on the screen here, and that's from that last test drive we did together. This is what I was looking for, and uh, this is what we found. This is an ignition system problem, guys. What we can notice is that the engine computer provided a ground here. You know, it attempted to energize this coil. When it let that ground go, we see extremely high, an extremely high firing line, and we do not see a spark line at all. Uh, we see some oscillations here. Um, I'll admit to you guys, I'm not the best at reading these uh, these ignition waveforms. Uh, what I can tell you is that if you see this, without a doubt, if you replace the plug and you replace the coil, you know, this being a coil on plug engine, you're gonna fix the car. But uh, I'm not good with that. I'm not 100% which one is causing this, the coil or the plugs. I just wanna kinda isolate that and uh, determine exactly which one it is. The way I'm gonna do that is I'll play a little Swaptronics. Uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna switch this coil to another cylinder and we're going to retie into it repeat the test drive and we're going to see if this pattern follows if it does then we know it's the coil if it doesn't then we uh we know it's the plug so let me get these switched around for you and uh we'll take it for another drive all right i'm back guys all i've done at this point is i have switched the number six ignition coil with the cylinder directly beside it which is the cylinder number five i did that under hood pretty simple one eight millimeter bolt Nothing really to show. So here's our old capture, that bad coil. I'm just going to get this buffer rolling again to make sure our connection is still good. And you can see that it is. Um, so this is what we want to see. I'm going to give this a little snap. You guys see how we're maintaining that spark line on this waveform? Ignore some of that noise in the, uh, in the spark line. But you can see that the spark line is always there. 
you can also notice that as engine RPM increases, this goes back to a single strike system. See here at idle, we have these two different firing events, this multiple strike event taking place. Raising the RPM, the engine computer only fires this coil once. So anyways, we're gonna monitor this coil. This coil is from cylinder five. It's now sitting in the number six hole. And we're gonna redrive this vehicle and we're gonna see if we see those characteristics of an ignition misfire taking place. All right, guys, I got the vehicle back on the road, and I'm just going to keep you guys focused on this uh, focus on this waveform. I'm going to give it some gas now. And what do we see? We see that this problem is still on this cylinder. What does that tell us? It tells us this plug, it's bad, guys, no doubt. So what do we need here in this case? You know, just thinking, driving this car. We, uh, we observed that we had an ignition misfire. We had a bad waveform on this uh, on this number six cylinder to identify whether it was the ignition coil or the plug causing it. All we did was we switched it with its neighboring cylinder, and we hooked back up to that coil. And uh, as we can see, you know, as we saw from that last uh, that last throttle event, you know the issue is still there. We still see this happening on this cylinder. So without a doubt, this thing needs a plug. Uh, what I can bet you guys, this being a six-cylinder engine with uh, about 120,000 miles on it, 125,278 to be exact, uh, what I can pretty much guarantee you guys is this isn't the only plug issue we have. Um, what kind of stinks about this is it's a pretty labor-intensive job to replace all of these plugs on this car. So uh, given what I've seen so far, my recommendation at this point is going to be to replace all six spark plugs. The intake manifold is going to have to come off. And based on how difficult that is to do, I'm also going to recommend to replace the rear three ignition coils and the coil boots on the front three cylinders. And I'm confident that this is going to take care of this car. Um, Looking at this waveform here, just to kind of show you what a good one would look like, really we want to see it look like that, you know, while we're giving it gas, you know, we're accelerating, loading the engine down. We want to see this spark line maintain itself. I'll give it one more go, hard on the throttle, and we can see we don't have that spark line. This plug is not firing. This is confirmed an ignition problem. That is the cause of the misfire trouble code. That is the cause of the hesitation and low power. And that is the cause of, you know, all of these issues, really. So uh, that's it, guys. I don't think I'm going to be able to show you this repair uh, in its completedness, given, given how labor-intensive it is and how pressed for time I'm going to be trying to get it done and get it out of the shop. But uh, hopefully this helped you guys out in dealing with a low-power hesitation slash misfire issue like this. Uh, any questions, leave them down in the comments, and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. So... Uh, Thanks for watching, guys.